Hi there, this is Elise Benin, your marketing mentor. And this is the podcast for you if and only if you are ready to leave the feast or famine syndrome behind, and I mean for good. Today's episode is an audio sneak peek at the conversation I'll be having on the stage at How Women Lead, which is part of How Design Live, which is being held this September 22nd through 25th in Denver, Colorado. I'll be interviewing Angelia McFarland. She is a serial innovator who has created and led innovation and reinvention in Fortune 50 corporations, startups, nonprofit organizations, and entrepreneurial ventures. I asked Angelia some of the questions I'll be asking at how, like what's the future of marketing and what role will AI play and how should leaders prepare for the shifts that have already started to take hold? I learned a lot in this conversation, and I know you will too. So listen and learn. All right. Welcome, Angelia, to the podcast. Hello, Elise. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about this discussion. Excellent. Me too. And uh, let's start, as I always do, tell the people who you are. Well, my name is Angelia McFarland. I am a 20 plus year technology industry veteran. I love technology. I kind of live and sleep and breathe it, but I love the marketing side of technology, the product marketing side. I've been in technology product marketing before it was even called that. And I focus a lot on trends and what's coming next. And that is why I, you see me a lot of times in conversations and discussions on things that aren't really there yet, um, because I focus on how to take those things and integrate them in ways that deliver value uh, for companies, for individuals. I think a lot of times when we're in a marketing role, we focus very much on the current revenue requirements. And I try to focus on how we build revenue requirements for the future. And that's a personal passion of mine, in addition to the technology roles that I play at major corporations. Interesting. All right. And our conversation and session at How Women Lead in Denver this September is what is the future of marketing? So I'm just going to put that question to you now so we can get a little taste of what that conversation is going to be. How would you answer what is the future of marketing? I think the future of marketing is infused with technology. I I really think, at least the future of all industries are infused with technology. Um, And I think the more that we understand the technologies that are coming down the development pipeline, uh, the more that we can take those technologies and create solutions that will benefit all audiences and not just the large, highly funded corporate audience. I don't think there's anything wrong with the highly funded corporate audience, but I do believe that several of these technologies that are coming to fruition in the next five to 10 years are going to make it possible for individuals, for small business owners, for for medium-sized businesses, for governments to do things in a way that have not been, that they have not done them before and to deliver greater benefit and value across their ecosystems. When you say technology also, can you be more specific? What kind of technologies are we talking about? A lot of people call them Web3 technologies. I think there's a range of technologies. AI is one. The changes in virtual reality, mixed reality, that's another technology. Um, Blockchain is a technology. Uh, Digital currencies, Bitcoin, crypto, those those are technologies. And so we see them as 
as products a lot of times, right? So we see NFTs, we see Bitcoin as a as an investment vehicle today. I think I think its value is, goes well beyond that. And so we see them as these products or these things that we can purchase and we can use, but there are underlying technologies that make them possible that can be integrated across different industries and different solutions. And I think the more that we understand what those technologies are and what the benefits are, it helps us as marketers within different industries to be able to leverage those technologies to help our whether it's a small business or whether it's a corporation, to help the business that we're interested in move faster and further and be first in delivering the next big thing. And for those who aren't exactly sure what Web3 technologies refer to, can you just define that for me? Web3, so most of those technologies I talked about would be considered Web3 technologies. Okay. Um, you get into a really technical discussion when you talk about Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3. And uh, Web 1 was just simple reading things on the internet. When, when the World Wide Web was first here and everybody had to type in www and, and uh, .com domains were easy to get, uh, that was when you just put static content on the web and, and you would read it and there was very little interaction. Uh, Web 2 was where we got into more e-commerce, more interaction, more being able to identify the people who were actually coming to the website, right? So it was more of an interactive type of web experience. As we move into Web 3, um, the Web 3 experience is going to be very different because it is going to be an experience where individuals... So today, Web 2 is still very centralized. The Web3 experience is going to be more driven by the individual who is accessing the web. The individual is going to have more autonomy, uh, more power, and they're going to, this is my view, if you would talk to a technician uh, or a technologist, they might say something a little bit different. But I do believe that as we move into the Web3 technologies, you're going to see individuals have more autonomy even over AI and being able to leverage AI for themselves versus having centralized companies say, this is my AI bot, this is my AI, my generative AI tool. I believe as we move in the next five to 10 years, you as an individual will be able to say, okay, well, I want my AI to do this and and my AI will interact with these other AIs um, to really deliver a more personalized self-directed experience. That's my, that is my vision and my view. Um, I, 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 and I, I have heard other people say similar things, but I don't know that, I don't think everyone believes that we're going to be there in five years. I do. And let's just dig in a little bit to this idea as it relates to marketing or the market itself. And I'm curious about what the shift is going to be in the next five or 10 years. I mean, I don't even know if we can predict that far out, but where exactly does AI fit in? Because you Can you give us some examples? Um, I think the easiest example is the one everyone is seeing now is the generative AI push. And with generative AI, you're seeing that companies like Google are now, so from a marketing perspective, Google now has a generative AI engine that sits at the top of the search the search results and it pulls out what that AI application believes is the best answer and it pulls it from information that thousands millions of companies have put onto the web uh, and so those companies are not necessarily surfaced in that answer and so Right now, the people who put information on the web are being glossed over by the generative aspect of the AI interface that's on Google, right? It's changing the search results you get at the bottom. Sometimes you don't even have to go to the search results at the bottom, depending on whether you're just looking for an answer for something. And so I think from a marketing and a creator perspective, that version of AI is changing our industry in ways that are that are bad for us 
However, I think AI has the promise and the capability if we pay attention and we're intentional about how we use it to do something a little bit different. And and when we talk about shifts, I think they're going to be huge shifts. So if Google figures out how to create a individual AI, which it's right now, it's not in their interest to do that, right? Um, But if they figure out how to do an individual AI and they figure out how to make money off of it, then they will continue to be the big gorilla at the top of the hill. So if there's some developer out there who's working on creating a software application and he's looking at how generative AI is now taking advantage of content that other people have created, and he says, hey, that's not fair. I'm going to create an AI application that allows companies and individuals to interact with Google's generative AI, possibly on a different site, right? That then provide the agency and the credit and the financial value to to these companies. And if that person is able to create that, then the shift in power is going to move from the big guys like Google and Meta to whoever this new company is. I think when it happens, it'll happen quickly. But we've got to, we have to get to a solution that really meets the needs of everyone and is scalable before, before we'll see that type of shift happen. And I think there's another element to it, Elise, is AI right now, I don't want to say it's a party trick. I don't think it is. I think there is a tremendous amount of intelligence and mathematics and technical computing infrastructure that goes behind it that makes it work. But this concept of generative that we have right now has been implemented in a way that in many cases removes the value from the creator. I think as individuals understand and learn how to use AI, what AI is, just like today, you know how to go in and potential, and like everyone learns a little bit of programming today, right? Just today, as you learn how to program things, I think there's going to be a version of AI in the future that is easier for individuals to program so that they can create AI bots that, that work for them. So there's an education. I said all that to say, I think there's an education piece that needs to happen for marketers, um, that needs to happen for individuals in general. Uh, before that shift happens as well. Right. And I think one of the things that the audience at How Women Lead is going to be especially interested in is how does this affect leadership roles and what exactly do leaders need to be thinking of or watching for or doing as these shifts continue to take place? What would you say? Well, I think leaders... Leaders have a lot of roles. Um, Leadership is a very important topic to me. Um, I think leaders should be planners and visionaries. And if you're a planner and a visionary, I think it's your role to understand. You don't necessarily have to be a technologist. But to understand that these technologies are coming, begin to understand how they may affect your industry, and then begin including it into your plans and helping your teams get the education that they need to create better plans. I think leaders are also coaches. And as a coach, when you're teaching some someone to do something new, there's a lot of different ways to teach something, right? One of the ways that I think is important in teaching is empowering people to learn and make mistakes and do it themselves. And so I think as a coach, there is a role for a leader to empower their team to, to think through what's going to happen in the future and come up with the crazy ideas that ultimately become the next big thing. I think leaders are also influencers and I think it's our role. And I try to do this myself um, to speak and promote the vision that they have for their industry or for their product or their product line. Um, And then the last thing I think is that leaders should be risk takers. And as a risk taker, you realize that There is a certain level of risk that you can afford. You take that risk so that you learn and you iterate and you build. Because if you just sit back and wait for everyone else to do it, you're coming in as as the also ran or you're coming in as a fast follower 
and you then miss the opportunity to actually lead in an area. That makes a lot of sense, actually. I love those four roles that you've outlined. Let's talk now about mistakes, because as things change and as we learn and try new things, we inevitably make mistakes. So we kind of have to accept that. But I think at the same time, we want to avoid the biggest mistakes. So what would you say are the biggest mistakes we should try to avoid making as we attempt to cope with these shifts? I think this space is so new and and it is so broad. So at the beginning of the call, we talked about all the different technologies. And those technologies, a lot of times you'll see them integrated together in certain solutions. And so because it is so new and so broad, I don't think anyone has the answer yet. Everyone has ideas. So I think the biggest mistake is to not take a risk. The biggest mistake is to say, okay, I'm going to wait. And we do this a lot in business because certain businesses are risk averse, right? I think the biggest mistake is to say, I'm going to wait and see what everyone else does. I think not waiting has looks like a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Like some industries, not waiting and moving is like just doing skunk works, just doing things internally because your business profile, you can't take a risk to throw a, a product out there that might not work. There are other industries that, you know, they want to dip their toe in the water. And one example I'll give you is um, Louis Vuitton leveraged the NFT craze and they created a special program for for their high-end customers where these high-end customers purchase these NFTs. Well, the NFT in and of itself, and they're they're called soulbound, S-O-U-L, soulbound tokens. And this particular token is soulbound, which means you can't sell it. So there is a certain segment of their customers who own these NFTs that they are forming relationships with. They provide early product sales to. So there's a creative artistic component to it. So when they create a new product, the NFT comes out and it looks like what the eventual product is going to be, if it's a jacket or a purse. And the person who has that NFT now has first access or own, or, or, or exclusive access to the product. So there's the products only go to the people who have the NFTs. This is a program that may ultimately be the way that high-end fashion is delivered in the future. Um, it may not, but it is an effort that gets the Louis Vuitton t- marketing team out there to try and understand how the technologies work, to see how the customers respond to the technologies, um, and then it allows them to iterate and build. And remind me what NFT means. I hear about it all the time and I ask this question, but I can never remember for some reason. (laughs) No worries. It stands for non-fungible token. And basically it is a, a token is a method of exchange on on a a blockchain network. And uh, non-fungible tokens have a specific standard and they typically have art or some sort of file that rides with them. It, it could be a document, but but most often today it is it is art. So the Louis Vuitton NFTs are is something that you purchase, and when you purchase it, you get a piece of art that is assigned to you and only you. Um, and there can be multiple instances of this piece of art. So it can be a piece of art, and there's a thousand, and um, each of them is numbered and and it is your specific NFT. It may look like the other thousand, but your specific NFT is yours. Um, And you hold that in your digital wallet and that provides you access to certain things. In the Louis Vuitton case, it provides you access to the products that are made available to to their customers who hold the NFTs. And it's not art I can put on my wall. So... The NFT itself is not art that you can put on your wall. However, some NFTs give you access to art that you can put on your wall. So it is, back to my point about education, it's still a really confusing space. So theoretically, you could create a piece of art on your wall. You could digitize it and you could sell it as an NFT. And and the NFT can be attached, can be one NFT that is attached to the to the physical piece of art that's on the wall. 
And the person who buys the digital NFT then has rights to the physical as well. And they can det- and they can say, hey, I want you to send it to me. No, I want you to leave it on your wall. I, I want to get it later. Right. But they but the NFT that they purchase is a digital representation of the art and it gives them certain rights. So it can be it can be confusing in implementation. Got it. And so here's my last question for you, Angelia. Is there a marketing trend that designers especially should be paying attention to? I think the generative AI trend is a trend that designers should be paying attention to because today the things that they design are being placed online and generative AI engines are pulling in their content and creating new content off of them. And there are certain vendors who have made a commitment to compensate designers. There are other vendors who do not. And I think this has been in the news a lot lately. I want to give you a different take on it. I think that there is another solution because I think what has happened today is the companies that are are doing this, they said, okay, we have generative and we have art and we have marketplaces. And so we're going to just put all those things together, right? It is, it is taking the technology we have and using it to do something different in a way that we do it today. I think that there are other options that would make a more valuable exchange for designers and their customers. But I, I think I think designers and creators need to be at the table to figure out what those are. And I, I think they are models that don't exist today. Mm, interesting. All right, that sounds like a cliffhanger. Let's leave it with this cliffhanger. And again, invite people to join us in September in Denver at yes. How Design Live. And you can register at How Design Live. And we'll talk a lot more about all of this. But Anjali, I just wanted to thank you so much for the conversation and the edification. And I can't wait to see you in September. Thanks, Elise. I'm looking forward to it. I do hope you learned a little something and will be joining us in Denver that September 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th for How Design Live and How Women Lead. You can register at howdesignlive.com. And if you want my help finding actual clients using AI, check out my new one-on-one AI client finding coaching calls or just sign up for my quick tips at marketing-mentor.com. Once you're on the site, you'll find lots more resources, including my simplest marketing plan. So enjoy, and I'll see you next time.